and who wrote to the Prime Minister asking that he enforce Canada's law which specifically prohibits anyone reasonably suspected of war crimes, such as the de treatment, uh, treatment of the detainees at Guantanamo Bay, not to mention Abu Ghraib or the black sites, from entering Canada. In her letter, which was addressed to the Prime Minister of Canada and the Minister of Immigration, Gail Davison stated, Inadmissibility to Canada is established when there are reasonable grounds to believe the foreign national has engaged in torture or other international crimes. There is no requirement for personal involvement. Neither is there any requirement for proof of the accusations. Evidence of Bush's involvement in authorizing a systemic regime of torture far exceeds the reasonable grounds, test, and triggers a legal duty to bar his entry to Canada. Explain a Canadian law as it applies to Mr. Bush, in your opinion, if you'd be so kind. Well, Keith, as you know, there's overwhelming evidence that while President and Commander-in-Chief of the or Army, George Bush, oversaw, directed, authorized, and supervised a system of torture that was long-term, widespread in many countries throughout the world. Now, under Canadian law, anyone suspected of a crime like torture is inadmissible to Canada. In addition to Gail Davidson's letter, Professor Anthony Hall wrote an article entitled Bush League Justice, Should George W. Bush Be Arrested in Calgary, Alberta to Be Tried for International Crimes? At a, 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 an event coming up in Winnipeg, where I was invited to give a paper by the sociology department, I wrote a paper, Should George W. Bush Be Arrested in Calgary, Alberta and Charged with International Crimes? Different groups of citizens, global citizens, are saying, look, if that level of crime can take place right out in open, even if it's involving our governments and our states, you know, torture is clearly against the law. Uh, if that kind of thing can just go without being addressed, then is there really such thing as a rule of law? So this question of how humanity deals with making decisions, do we just go with the idea that might is right, the strongest prevail, I have the biggest gun, I have the biggest arsenal of missiles, I have the biggest arsenal of nuclear weapons, on and on up the scale. So how would the Canadian Prime Minister deal with the alleged illegality of George Bush's visit to Canada? How would it look if he afforded impunity to somebody with whom he shared political and ideological views? He was too busy playing the piano. The Beatles, ironically. <laughs> At least in a democracy, we don't just have one leader to turn to. At least there was Jason Kenney, the Minister of Immigration. He surely would care about the laws enshrined in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, which rendered Bush inadmissible to Canada. Immigration and Refugee Protection Act says that people who support terrorist organizations financially uh, are inadmissible to Canada. The Immigration Refugee Protection Act are inadmissible to Canada. This Immigration Refugee Protection Act, Immigration Refugee Protection Act. It's about our laws and ensuring that they are consistently enforced. Kenny did allow the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act to keep George out of Canada in the third week of March 2009. The problem was he barred the wrong George. Barred from entering the country by border officials on national security grounds. Rather than barring a credibly accused war criminal from entering Canada. Kenny, allowing politics to mix with law enforcement, barred peace activist George Galloway from Canada. Galloway was barred because of his eloquent opposition to the 9-11 wars and for bringing humanitarian aid to Gaza in order to alleviate the suffering which Human Rights Watch describes as a humanitarian crisis resulting from Israel's unlawful blockade. Why do you think you were banned then? We've heard the government side. Why do you think it is that you are not allowed into this country? Well, they initially said it was because of my views on Afghanistan, though that morphed over the days into a criticism of the aid convoy that I took into Gaza. Uh, 24 ambulances, a fire engine, uh, 
trucks full of wheelchairs, children's nappies, biscuits, food, medicines. It's an odd definition of terrorism, no? Jason Kenney repetitively claimed that George Galloway was a supporter of Hamas. That because of his support for Hamas, which he is very public about, uh, he's inadmissible to Canada. He's very willing that he is inadmissible under our law because of his support for, in this particular instance, Hamas. Talking about his financial support for this illegal banned anti-Semitic terrorist organization, Hamas. So this is a recent fact. This was a lie. Galloway, in fact, supports the opposition to Hamas and always has done. They refuse to acknowledge that the Palestinian people voted for Hamas. Now, I have never been a supporter of Hamas. Like the noble and right honourable gentleman from Manchester Gorton, I was all my life a supporter of and a friend of the late President Arafat. As it happens, I've never been a supporter of Hamas, but I am a supporter of democracy. And the Palestinian people have the right to choose their own leaders. And I can't turn up in Gaza with ambulances and look around for some opposition to give them to. I can only give them to the authorities in Gaza, which is what any NGO would do. It's what the UN would do. It's what the Canadian Red Cross would do. What else can you do? You have to deal with the authorities that are elected to govern the place. And that happens to be Hamas. I wouldn't have voted for them, but the Palestinian people did kind of decision by the Canadian government, criminalizing the Palestinian cause, criminalizing uh, uh, a leading spokesman for their cause outside in the world, is not going to help. I don't know why the Canadian government wants to make Canada amongst the hated on the earth. Canada used to be loved in the world. You know, I'll, it's I'll, had a great reputation. Why, why are you destroying it all? Like the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, the Crimes Against Humanity and War Crimes Act, was being used flexibly as a political tool, while the Canadian government brazenly ignored lawyers and scholars who demonstrated that George W. Bush should be arrested, they vociferously prosecuted a Rwandan named Munyaneza, who was convicted in 2009 for his role in the CIA-sponsored Rwandan genocide. While voluminous politicians, law professors and the media were keen to advertise the precedent set with the conviction of the Rwandan genocide heir, they were far less keen to take the politically incorrect step of calling for Bush's indictment under the same law. Professor at the University of Western Ontario, and she joins me from London tonight. Hello. I think it's a very positive development for international criminal law and for Canadian law. This is the first time that anyone has been held responsible here in Canada for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and it is also, I think, a watershed for justice in terms of it being an example for other countries around the world to which uh, genocide air may have fled. Seemingly, Africans were expendable, the conviction of whom compounded the mythology of Canada as a supporter of human rights. However, when it came to US leaders, such as Bush, who, according to a study by the Johns Hopkins University, was responsible for the deaths of up to 1.3 million people and who signed off on torture, the culture of impunity was allowed to prevail. Perhaps a near unanimous silence about Bush's illegal visit to Canada among law professors stemmed from the fact that Bennett Jones, one of Canada's most prominent law firms, was co-sponsoring the visit of Bush to Calgary, effectively spitting in the face of the law. Bennett Jones is the biggest donor to the University of Calgary Law School. The law library in the University of Calgary is called the Bennett Jones Law Library. How can we rely on an impartial and law-abiding legal profession when both the law schools and the future employers of law students encourage and profit from the culture of impunity? Throughout history, when the rule of law has failed, ordinary citizens have been compelled to respond by taking the law into their own hands. Those who realise the implications of the Canadian government's politically motivated lawlessness vis-à-vis -vis Bush were compelled to decide how best to respond. Splitting the Sky was well versed in the scholarship of Professor Francis Boyle, Professor of International Law at the University of Illinois, Boyle emphasised the distinction between civil disobedience and civil resistance. 
While civil disobedience consists of deliberately breaking laws which are deemed unjust or